Radio at freedomslips.com. It's two in the morning. On the east coast of the United States, I have no idea what time it is down and under. But it is time for Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mecky. So I hope you have your tinfoil hat all made and cinched down tight over your ears. So take it away, Dave and Mecky. Welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave and... Mackie. <laughs> I tricked him today. We are coming to you wherever you are and, and whatever technology you're using. Live from the Sydney studios in Australia. We're in the chat room at freedomslips.com while we're on air, which is really cool because you can talk to us while we're on air. You don't have to ring us up. You can talk to us. You can chat to us. Chat about the topic. You can suggest things. You can, you can discuss that with us and the other listeners in there and you can also see all the, the links we paste into into them sorry into there into the chat room so they can see it you can see it too follow us on youtube facebook twitter blogger you name it we're there and i really would like you to subscribe subscribe to our channel our youtube channel would be good uh, you can go to our website shinysideout.net for our show archives notes and links we placed into the chat so if you did happen to miss it the links you'll find anyway, and the show notes are available on our website. Uh, if you didn't know it, Revolution Radio is listener-supported. It is on air, online, and on your smartphone. If you're anyone but the ABC, Central Coast, uh, you're stealing my line. If you live in Kentucky, <laughs> tune in on FM. You can find WZZR 101.3. Or if you're anywhere else in the entire universe that still has some kind of VPN access through to the Earth's internet, then you can get an app. Obviously, it's too far in the future. You probably have to get a different kind of app or whatever it is or use some subspace. If you're using subspace, don't forget to get the app that's compatible with your device in your, in your universe and your parallel dimension. But currently, the Earth provides one. <laughs> Revolution Radio has an app of its own. TalkStream Live is an app. TuneIn.com is an app. You can find also StreamFinder.com, Internet-Radio.com. Radio Tuner has an app. And, but we prefer this one if you, you know, Hawk doesn't mind. It's dual. It's sort of branded, not dual branded entirely. But you can listen to the station wherever you are. If you're a fan of the show, Shiny Side Out. That's our app. It's cool. I like it. I made it. At home, though, if you're not into all of that other stuff, and all you want to do is, I turn the audio off of my phone. If you all you want to do is listen on a conventional radio, get yourself a Grace branded digital tabletop radio it's really cool you'll like it it um it feels it feels actually mickey it's like when i grew up our friends had a wooden radio with all of the call signs pre-printed on the dial you can go to them it was really nice uh if you okay, are yep. yeah if you're driving around in that was in the days of course when you had to hide the the technology you had as furniture somehow mm. for some reason um, you know, a stereo cabinet with a record player was actually completely disguised as a piece of furniture. Awesome. Um, yeah, so driving around in a General Motors vehicle with a, re a receiver-enabled radio is another way to listen to Revolution Radio. All of these things are revolutions in radio. I love that. I made that up. That term was mine. Thank you. Guess what? Since it's listener-funded, as I mentioned earlier, what you can do is you can subscribe on a monthly... Or you can make a donation, one-off, or however you feel necessary or inclined to. And you can donate different quantities of money. Uh, you know, 5, 10, a lazy 10, lazy 20, whatever you feel comfortable with. However, once you get over a certain amount, you can actually get something back for that. So you can get, if you donated $30, you can get a CD if your favorite host's show from 2014 that'd be awesome do that for shiny side out just saying don't forget to mention it in the descriptive box if you're making a donation 
There's also seed packs. There's uh, USB sticks. Uh, there is absolutely tons of different things that you can get on offer. So not only do you get the hosts across the entire platform at any time you wish to listen to the station, you get access. I think there's also access to the archives. But don't quote me on that. There might be a fee instead. But if you're going to pay for the fee, pay a little bit more and you can get something else as well. All of these things are available to you. Make your choice. But if you pick up just one nugget of information from any of the shows, any of the hosts, any of the shows, any time you're listening, even from the archives, I recommend you do what Mickey and I have done, and that's donate. Because donating really runs this station. We don't get paid for this. Everyone's doing it on a volunteer basis. And if you're a sponsor uh, listening to for um, ad space, we're allowed to advertise your product. So the call goes out there also. If you want us to talk about a water filter or a, um, a some kind of survival foods or anything you like, go ahead. We'll probably support it. Do you know why? Mecky, this week I'm going to tell you something really cool before I announce the call-in number. If you haven't already seen it, Mecky, I tested my children on crickets. That I don't mean I took them out to the field. I saw that, yeah, I did. And I didn't hammer things <laughs> into the ground and throw a ball at them. No, these were dried crickets, a packet of dried crickets made for human consumption. And I did a little video, put it on, on um, Facebook. So if you're looking for me, look for me on Facebook. My, my name's out there. So um, anyway, and you'll see it. It's really cool. And my girls ate it. And Your that, kids you know, went to the chocolate awfully fast, though. So yeah. yeah, that's what everyone <laughs> seemed to comment. But you know what? It's just because it was, yeah. it, that was just rather dry. <laughs> there, it, it wasn't that it was... Um, uh, oh, after no. the break, I promise, after the break, I'll eat the rest of them <laughs> from the packet. Honestly, I'll do it on mm, air. Mm. It's really not awful at all. They don't even taste nutty. That was the thing that I was really surprised about. Because, uh, you know, all of, mm -hmm. most of insects just taste sort of nutty. There's really nothing else to it. Because these are dried, you know. There's not much to it. So, um, mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Yeah, you know, I think it would be nice in a stir-fry with some sauce or something. It would be nice. You wouldn't even notice at all. It would be just a texture. Um, yeah, so, so don't, you know, you'll see them in the shelves. I think they're going, there's uh, companies are now putting these out. So um, I chose the salt and vinegar because I thought that would be t lots more flavor to c disguise them. But really, I don't think they're needed. They're really nice. And I, I think if that was the only food I'd have, I'd be quite actually pretty happy with myself. And my girls would eat it. They're already across it. Well, look, it how good is that? That's, that's the best. It's good, though. You look... Oh. It's an excellent uh, source of protein, any of those bugs. Uh, and you still got me? Yeah, I Hello? do. But the vid's a bit wonky, oh. so if you just turn it off for a while, I'll okay. see how we go. I'll, ju I'll just turn it off. There we go. Uh, look, um, the um, yeah, no, it's an excellent source of protein. In fact, worms as well, earthworms, you know, bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and on, just on that, uh, you just uh, triggered my, uh, my, my memory there. Watch Survivor. I love watching Survivor, the show, right? I find it uh, interesting. And clearly, all Americans on the show, this particular one, and uh, they're in Cambodia this season, and the challenge was a food challenge. Cam uh, Cambodian, uh, I guess, uh, specialties or you know, whatnot, uh, it was like deep fried tarantula, deep fried water beetle, you know, things like that, and they also had balut, which is duck fetus, really, in, in, in an egg, and you know what? I'm looking at it, I love to eat all that food. <laughs> that's the kind <laughs> of food that I eat when I travel. I'm thinking, that's not a challenge, that's just, you know, I, could, I pay good money for that. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's funny. It's true. It's true. It, uh, it is I, mean, true. I applaud you and your, especially your daughters, for trying. That's that's really great. Do you know what? All I said to them was, "Look, I'm. We're going to sit down and watch Naked and Afraid." There's another plug for another show, by the way. We just mentioned Survivor. <laughs> and, that's true. And we're talking up Naked and Afraid. My girls love it. They think it's cool. Um, I, I'm sure it's M, and you know the authorities hate me because I'm. You know, it's it's meant to be M or something. Really, it's not. What's what's wrong with it? They just eat creatures. You know, they're in the wild. If we had nothing, they'd be exposed to that immediately. Yeah. So no, I no, it's the naked bit. Oh, they're, they're it's the naked all, bit that makes it. What naked? It's all blurred. You can't see it I'm anyway. Saying, no, 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 no. I hear you. I hear it's, what you're saying, but that's what makes it M. That's the only it, reason. But on MythBusters, you know, they even blur out the brand on their T-shirt. Why would they let? <laughs> why would they let them wear the T-shirt on air if they're gonna if they're gonna blur it? <laughs> 
I know, right? <laughs> yeah, completely. That someone should be saying, oh, you got to get you know, swap that T-shirt just with a plain black one or something, yeah? Do that, because whatever the logo is, we can't show it. They haven't, they haven't associated with us. They're not paying us any money. No, we're going to blur it. Good on you. Well, anyway. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to do, um you know to wear logos. I, I, I'm good now. Um, so I, I I thought the first thing that I should do is get the packet. I saw the packet available, bought it, thought yeah, fantastic. But how do I deliver that to my girls? And I said, well, come on down. Let's sit down and watch Naked and Afraid. And when they've got to eat the most disgusting thing that you see, we'll eat some crickets because mm-hmm. they should be eating crickets. Crickets mm. are good for you. High protein, but you never really see them eat the crickets, right? And so, um, you know, they're starving. It's 21 days, and their, their tummies have been rumbling for 20, 21 of those days, <laughs> all of the days. And, you know, they've lost, you know, eight, eight stone or something. And, um, you know, they're, they're so close to, to dying, it's not funny, but, you know, that they, they make it to the, the out, out zone, and there they go. And I thought, well, that's not really survival, and now they've got the XL version, which is 40 days or something. Yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see them crawling just with their, with their two limbs with sticks, <laughs> dragging themselves <laughs> along. You know, I, I want to see something because it, it, it's not exciting. It really isn't. Like, they, they build a shelter. Fantastic. That's great. Build a shelter. Um, but I wanted my kids to get across this. I wanted them to understand that, you know, it's not so terrible. Because if it ever happens, how on earth are you going to get the children across it when it's too late? Yeah. Because, you know, my kids go, oh, I'm not going to eat carrot. I don't like carrot. And I go, well, <laughs> how are you going to go with crickets? And I kept saying that. I said that for like two years. How are you going to go with crickets if you don't like carrot? You've got to eat everything on your plate. When I grew up, everything on a plate had to be eaten. Everything. You don't get up from the table till you finish. We give it to you. You've got to eat it. There's people kind of starving. There's starving people all over the place. Yeah? And so I say, oh, well, okay. All right. So um, uh, look, the call-in number is 347-688-2902. And I'm just going to hand it to Mickey. I've got, I've got a little uh, thing to do. Hang on a second. Yeah, not a worry. Uh, look, uh, yeah, and uh, and do the, I mean, uh, we may have time to call in. Uh, again, we have to get through uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of show notes, guys, so uh, do uh, bear with us, and, and, and we apologize if we can't take any calls. However, if you've got questions in the, the chat room, I way there. If you're listening uh, on YouTube, <clears throat> you know, uh, you can listen to the show live and be in the chat room at Freedom Slips. Dot com. It's, it's fairly simple to navigate there, and you can either become a uh, you know you can get an alien name doesn't really matter whatever you like, and ev- everyone's welcome and everyone can ask questions um, and we can, we we will certainly answer them or at least attempt to. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for joining us on this Halloween weekend. I can imagine that you guys are uh, have maybe had a bit of uh, trick or treating, had, had, had a bit of uh, partying going on. We, we just got a thunderstorm coming through here, so you might hear some rumbling while I speak, and I'm hoping it's not going to affect the connection to Dave. However, so yeah, so um, I can imagine that uh, you know some of our regular listeners are probably still out trick or treating, maybe on Halloween party. Um, Maybe maybe something interesting. I know in the States it's huge. Believe it or not, here in Australia, it's, it's getting bigger. It's not really an Australian holiday as such, but my neighborhood where I am, uh, we, we probably last night, um, because I'm in the future, remember? I'm in your future. <laughs> it's the 1st of November here. Um, last night, we probably had about 100 kids come through on average, like I'd say, roughly, uh, and uh, consuming a lot of candy. And I, I carved uh, five pumpkins, and my brother carved another pumpkin. Our efforts are visible on Facebook. I love uh, pumpkin carving and I've done this now, this is the fourth year running I think, and each year I carve more, next year I might uh, carve 10 pumpkins. It's good fun and I do hope that as a holiday it uh, it takes off here in Australia. But uh, Dave, um, uh, did we want to share some news items with our esteemed listeners? Yeah, in fact there was two news items and, and I was just reminded of one. My girls just called me upstairs to go and check on what she reported to be a wasp. And she was right, it was a wasp all right. It was in the house, although it wasn't very well. It was on its side and uh, complaining awfully that it was losing its life. Um, it was a paper wasp. That's what they call it. And um, it builds a little paper nest up under the eaves of your house or in bushes. And if you put your hand in there, they'll all sting you. Uh, 
and I'll sting you repeatedly. They're, they're terrible. Uh, no one in the house is stung, luckily. I put it outside. But it reminds me of a story that I saw yesterday. And the story is that scientists have discovered that there's three species of wasp that are changing. Their current, their DNA is changing. They're changing into a new creature. Okay. These three species of wasps only recently have begun this transition. Now, I've, I hope everyone remembers that I've spoken about what they're called uh, jumping jacks, and they're ants now um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that live in Australia, and they used to be wasps. They were wasps, and they discarded the wings in a flying bit, deciding that it was much easier just to walk around. And they've got the brains, the brain capacity of a flying object, so they're able to negotiate three-dimensionally. They've got the eyesight of something that needs good eyesight to fly. And they're predators. And so the uh, wasp of the, the same ilk that didn't turn into a, an ant are wasps that fly up to some of Australia's biggest spiders in the web, sting them, and, and fly them away. And I'm talking about the, the golden orb spiders, Mickey. Really? They're big. They are, they are big. They are big. These are big things. And so, In Australia, we've got big spiders, but these, these are up there with the big ones. <laughs> so. And you can walk into the web and take three paces, and it stretches, and when you walk backwards out of it, because it didn't break, it's still intact. And that's the orb spider webs, and um, they're mm. just about to go go crazy and um yeah, so that's true so I, I was amazed to see that scientists have discovered the dna is changing in these wasps and they're actually changed they're changing we're seeing something happen on a human scale not on a geologic scale or the normal kind of dna changing evolutionary mm -hmm. scale and we've seen the effect of it because we've we've got the jumping jack one of the only countries in the world that has um, an ant that came from a wasp so it was a, it was an ant, went to a wasp, went back to an ant. Yep. But it retained the wasp wasp sting, because it can, contains all the chemicals that wasps have. So um, so we don't know where these ones are going. Very interesting. But the other topic, Mickey, I was going to bring up, and I was only reminded of that because the wasp that came in the house. Uh, the other one was, we've had another plane crash. Yes, we did. And it's Go another, ahead. It's another Airbus. Airbus, it is. <laughs> another one. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be Airbus. Airbus, would you? Airbus, no, no. Oh, I don't like the Airbus, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, when I'm from Cornwall. Um, so, I, I was... When I, when I heard the news this week, I, I couldn't believe that another one had gone down. Now, there's conflicting evidence... Uh, sorry, stories, not evidence. There's no evidence. There's conflicting stories everywhere that um, it was shot down or, it, or it, it failed of some kind or, you know, obviously we're going to hear about the pilot you know, wanting to commit suicide, all these stupid stories. And yet they still haven't found 370. They've tried to put MH17 to bed, but then look what happened when they started mentioning that. You know, Russia said, hey, look, we didn't shoot it down. It was, it, you know, and uh, it must have been in the Ukraine. Well, it was in the Ukraine. It was probably Russia. Well, it, we don't know. No one knows for sure. And was the mm. whole thing fabricated? We don't know. Mm. As most stuff is today. Well, this is the thing, right? And this is really a problem. I mean, you, you watch the news and or you, maybe you try to keep yourself informed. And then the truth is you're being given what, uh, what has been determined by someone else very carefully. Mm. We're being fed what is, what is you know. I don't want to take too far because I want to get the show notes, but if you want to look at Syria, for example, when, who do you think the bad guys there? You know, who are the good guys who are the bad guys? It is surprisingly, a congresswoman recently on CNN said, uh, a congresswoman, that's one of your guys, mm -hmm. right? she said to get out of there, right? And her name is, I'll tell you who it is, was um, I saw Tulsi, that. Tulsi Gabbard. It's I Tulsi, saw that like, story, Mickey. Yeah, good story, right? Yeah. And she was talking to Wolf Blitzer. Wolf Blitzer and CNN is, is one of those puppet shows. So I figure... 
if, if they're getting it on CNN, which is just one uh, another one of those those uh, marionette or you know um, mm-hmm. <laughs> hand puppet uh, uh, hand puppet shops, then I'm, I'm I'm curious about what the agenda is here, right? Um, are we trying to 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 destabilize the American effort in in, in Syria, or is something else at play? I, I don't know. Uh, but but the point is, if 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 it is on CNN, then then it was sanctioned. Well, okay, uh, Obama, uh, <laughs> are you correct, but Obama said no troops into Syria. And now he's got yeah. active, act, yeah. That's what he, well, that's what he said, right? And this is this is this thing that I'd like to point out to everybody. All politicians lie. They lie, in, mm-hmm. instead of saying new information has come to hand, and my previous decision was based on what we knew before, honestly, because that never happens. Um, but now I, I really think we should, uh, you know, we should call and summon our forces to do X. And you, then, but no one asks why. Then I say, well, what is your intel? Oh, I can't give that away. <laughs> why not? Well, you know, we're, we're asking the people to be with us. So just do that for us, shall we? Yeah, come on. Yeah. And, but, but we don't know. No one knows what the actual reason is there's still all, all this disputed zone Mecky. there's the handover of the you know world police torch and i'm going to say this on air i'm going to say this live say it we're here right now <laughs> and if you're anyone but darren hinch uh you're stealing my bit and um <laughs> right here right now that i i, I believe i i believe through because I, I get a lot of rt news rt al jazeera mm-hmm. Um, BBC and the World News and it's uh, independent news outlets and all I'm seeing right now is that I think Putin is winning the game with Syria uh, in Vienna that is with Syria, Iran uh, Saudi Arabia uh, making an alliance with Russia and the no-fly zone over Syria should be with her, uh, upheld because that's the owner of the country. Uh, but now you've got Saudi Arabia involved. Oh my goodness. We had mm. the second hospital blown up by Saudi Arabia in Yemen. This was another Doctors Without Borders hospital blown to smithereens. That's the second one in two weeks, Mackie. Yeah, I know. Would you like to be a Doctor Without Border right now? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm going home. You know, you can have yeah. your wound, wounded. I don't care. The refugee incidences around the planet aren't being... Um, the media you're seeing is terribly filtered. Oh, and, yeah. And if you watch YouTube and try and catch the stuff before it's pulled down, you'll see conflicting reports of what you see in the media. They're, they're taking a one-sided approach to that, let me tell you. So try and get a balanced report. Uh, and all I see is this... The handing of the torch of the world police from the U.S. to Putin, I think he's going to be winning over the, the global, um, uh, what would I, village, the global village, Mickey. If we were, if, if he was the, if the U.S. was the current shaman and a new shaman came into town, that would be Putin. At the moment, I think he's winning. Mm. It just seems to me he's winning on a global on the global village, he's getting more support his way because he, he's he's selling it the way it is. And look, I'm not saying that I support either side. I'm this is completely impartial. We're in a country that, unfortunately, our government said we're going to start airstrikes in Syria. Not that I wanted that to happen, but guess what? They haven't said a word now, have they, Mackie? Since the no-fly zone has been in in place. Yeah, look, that's right. Not that's one exactly bit of media right. on it. They've they've mm-hmm. completely gagged on the entire event now, and it was in the media for two weeks. Big talk it up. Let's go and do it, and then suddenly Russia steps in and does nothing. So you have to think about that. You really do. All yep. the reasons why we went to yep. war in the past. Now China is saying, "I'm not afraid to go to war against U.S. if if the U.S. is going to be so stupid." as to um, encroach upon our claimed sovereignty again. Don't be idiots. We're warning you. And that's because they don't want to lose hmm. face in front of their people. They've claimed this territory. They've, they've, they've set their position on the, on the game board. 
and the US is playing with it. And the next thing that's going to happen is there'll probably be some kind of conflict as a result of it. China's saying, go away. I'm, yeah, I'm look, warning you. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. Look, look, the, the thing is this. We, we are... People say, oh, you know, um, what is this new Cold War? No, not really. We, we are in the... Um, we are in the... Um, in the middle of uh, World War Three, we've been uh, we have been in World War Three since the early nineties. In mm -hmm. fact, people think, "Oh no, everything is better." You know, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Yugoslavia collapsed, Iraq collapsed. You know, all these collapses—they're <laughs> all good. No, no, they're not. Mm. They're, they're, they're distinctly not good. They're the opposite of good, which is bad. They're bad. <laughs> so, um, the, the the problem here is that uh, this is a, this has been a shooting war for a long time now, right, with, with, uh, with uh, proponents that are propped up by the same financiers as in the past, both sides in fact financed by the same banking houses, and this shooting war is likely to escalate <clears throat> in the Middle East. Um, it, it is never a good idea to have, uh, I guess, ancient, well not ancient, but old adversaries such as Russia and America in the same airspace, not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, Russia and, and Great Britain and and France and and you know the old enemies in Europe, uh, they should also not share an airspace. <laughs> not a good idea. You can't win a war though without ground troops. So a statement like "Oh, we're not going to send any ground troops in" is a, is a complete nonsense. Uh, now, unless now, you have no intention of winning a war. But he's changed. His, he's changed his mind now. Now they've got ground troops going in. Yeah, some ten thousand. Well, exactly because it's a, that's you're exactly right. It's a it's, it's it just doesn't make any sense. You can't win a war. Uh, from the air, you can you can destroy an enemy pretty good, but you can't occupy any any any, any territory. No, and and, and wait wait so, the, the last point the last yeah. point is that um the, all the statements from the U.S. military in the last three days were aimed at toppling the Assad government. Nothing mm -hmm. they they say ISIL. The American government uses the term ISIL, but the U.S. media says ISIS, where the actual name yeah. is Daesh. <laughs> The actual name of it is called Dash, mm. right? Uh, but everyone in the media calls it ISIS, but the American government's the only one that calls it ISIL. They refuse to call it anything else, and I don't know what the hell that means. My guess is that means the Assad government regime, because the only people, they're arming, they're arming rebels and pushing them into the country. I, I still, yeah. I, just once again, imagine if China was doing that. In Mexico, so I, I can tell you, I can tell you what uh, ISIL means, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it, it means the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant being the, uh, I guess the, the the Middle Eastern corridor, which starts with Turkey, and goes all the way into what was ancient Sumeria. And ISIS means the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Mm. So I, I have no idea. Why the Americans insist on calling it ISIL, the Levant? Because the Levant is pretty much a World War One term. Uh, go look it up, guys. It's interesting. You know, even 19th century. Uh, but yes, so so and, and you're right, though, Dave. Um, uh, ISIS, ISIL, whoever, whatever, those guys that are now holding quite a bit of land, land area uh, were created and are being funded by, by uh, the US. most likely uh, an American uh, three-letter acronym agency mm. or agencies. Well, they are because um, they're they're sending the weapons in, training them. It's all U.S. trained, uh, U.S. money, U.S. weapons. Yep. And the only time they got upset with them was when they started shooting other people. Going, well, we, we own the oil now, so <laughs> all the money you were giving us—that's peanuts now. We, we're making our own money, so good luck with that. That's yes. the, that's the media statement. But I don't think that's true because he, he they repeatedly say we're going to bring down the Assad regime. What? That's not the ISIS. That's that's Assad. That's a completely yeah. different war. In fact, destabilizing Assad will play right into ISIS, ISIL, whatever hands. Exactly. Uh, because it's just another leader that that has gone by the wayside in the Middle East in this in this great game we're seeing now. Interestingly. Mm -hmm. You know, America and, and even Russia prefers military um, inter or, uh, interference or, or action, whereas China goes in with, uh, you know, a business kind of uh, a mindset, you know, uh, buying resources and, and, and uh, building the economy that way and getting influence that way. They don't really go in with troops. I mean, I have, n have you ever seen China intervene anywhere militarily? I mean, apart from its own territory, like it didn't send any troops to, to the Middle East, didn't send any troops to Africa or anywhere like that, right? 
No, you're absolutely correct. They did not. Mm. But now they're they're putting their foot on the ground, and they're they're setting their fences. And yes, this is this is yeah. the exact thing that you would expect. They've now realised they're large enough, strong enough, and militarised enough to compete in the in the game. And they sat mm -hmm. back to learn. They learned everything from everyone else. And all I'm going to tell you is, I've examined all of their air bases, every single one. It's taken me like three months. And I've, I've looked at all of their underground military facilities where roads just go in and there's an airstrip above on the mountain somewhere and everything underneath is an underground, underground, underground base. I've looked at them all and they're not doing anything new, but they're everywhere. And their entire intention is to be able to attack after a first strike. Well, yeah. yeah. You have everything underground. All your assets are underground. You, you have very low military asset value on all of the ground, the, the targets. Even all the straight roads, Mickey, I want to bring this up to everyone. everyone. Even the straight roads that lead into the airport are three kilometers long and mm. clear-sided. You can land on those roads with the same aircraft. They're equivalent to a runway. Yeah. And so if you took the you... runway, if you took the airport out, you'd mm. still be able to get via the apron to these other roads and use those. They're very clever. No, yeah, no I agree. I completely agree. There aren't many other countries in the world that have all their assets underground. Uh, the, mm. U the US's Air Force bases, if you have a look at them, not much is underground. Mm -hmm. You'd be you'd be uh, a lot e lot easier off if you had two different foes to choose from, and one of them had their all their assets underground, and the other one didn't. You know, I I, I know what I throw my money on. So you know, I mm -hmm. just just think about that for a minute, Mecky. Um, the the last quick note on this, um, I received in the mail. I don't have it with me, but I received in the mail that the area that I, I live in is going to have uh, war games, low flying military aircraft for some two weeks coming up from this week really yeah and mm, okay. um, there's some kind of huge military thing going and i can't find any other media on it except for the thing that was dropped into the letterbox that's interesting yeah uh, i mean to, you know to put this in context guys he dave that is <laughs> lives mm -hmm. in uh, lives uh, i guess a couple hours north of, of sydney in what could be described a rural uh, setting uh, of no strategic value to anyone. <laughs> I'm mm. sorry, Dave, but I think that's that's probably the best description. Um, in fact, that, that was that was my intentional choice, uh, right? I know. Mm. Uh, so having war games there, um, well, I, well, you know, whatever. They, I'm sure they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll I'll um I'll just ensure that I've got let, my phone. Let, let me know how that works out for you, okay? And I'm also <laughs> I'll make sure that I've got my phone hey, ready, Mickey, to record when I'm getting strafed by an F-18. Please, please do that. Yeah. And um, this and before we before we start in the show notes, which we will just after this comment, a question to you, Dave. In fact, you told me you've been sick recently. Actually, you have been sick a lot uh, in, in recent times, mm -hmm. and you and you just got over being sick. So, so my question is: Is is it possible that they've maybe um ah look this is this is complete tinfoil sure. head, uh, uh, you know stuff? But do you think they have sprayed the population, uh, maybe to to make them more complacent, compliant? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, other sinister. Uh, uh, end to these war games that you know with with uh, having been sprayed maybe makes you a little more um dulled and you won't perceive it you won't see it you won't um, you know say tell anyone about it i don't know i'm just saying it might make you glow under a particular kind of light who knows maybe it, uh, who uh, knows it might make you so visible you know with the cockpit <laughs> radar or, or you know goggles or something i don't know i, I just don't know um i, I hmm. i've been hideously unwell guys and uh, you don't want to have to, you know, that thing where you get a fever and chills for days and days and days, and all you can do is sweat it out. Um, well, I've been so off color that um, I've just been, all I've been able to do uh, around the clock is uh, sleep for a little bit, get up trying to hydrate, and then sleep for more, and then get up and hydrate. That's pretty much it. It's the cycle I've had. But boy, you don't want it. And I feel rotten too, I'll <laughs> tell you, Mickey. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> rotten. That's not good. No, no but it's okay. Um, I just want to direct everyone to our merchandise. Dave, if you haven't got a... <laughs> yeah, there's, a there's a plug. Um, if you haven't got a uh, shiny side out mug, these are absolutely huge and uh, they're delicious um, uh, beverage holders. 
So uh, get yourself one. Um, there's links on our website. Please do. <laughs> now, with, without further ado, uh -huh. <laughs> without further ado, I think we're helping someone in the church room. Geography homework, which is all good. So just to, again, the Tasman Sea separates us from New Zealand, and the Coral Sea lies between Melanesia and Australia. Just That's in case correct. You want to know. Coral Sea, beautiful, beautiful place if you want to go holiday. But uh, don't swim easier in for it. Us than for you. <laughs> so <laughs> don't don't swim, right? <laughs> no, don't swim in it because the saltwater crocs are bad, and the uh, yeah. the stingers are bad, and the irukandji yeah. are even worse. You can't even see them in the water; they're so small, like yeah. a sixteenth of an inch across, and they'll paralyze you. So uh, I yeah. one one more comment on this, and I'll leave this picture with you. It'll be burned forever in your forebrain. Uh oh. Um, I went there. I went to the uh, Great Bar Barrier Reef, and um, I had to wear a stinger suit. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a large guy, right? I, I weigh 120 kilos. Just uh, I don't know what's that. In, I don't know what that's uh, in, in stone or whatever. But uh, anyway, pounds is kilos. is 2.2 times that. Right there you go. That's how much I weigh. And. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm fairly built, but I'm also, over the years, have, have, uh, have put on extra pounds where they shouldn't be. And the only color stinger suit they had <laughs> was pink. Oh, pink. lovely. Hot pink. I looked Ooh. like Porky Pig. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's good enough. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But st stinger suits, if any that's part of your skin is brushed, <laughs> just brushed by the tentacle of the irukandji, which mm. is only about a millimeter big, then um, it's it's all over for you. Right? It's a hospitalization. It feels like you're on fire for weeks. Yes, oh, it's it's not good. Mm. You know nettles? Have you ever been stung by nettles? Uh, I I know I have You've from the back of a idea. leaf. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So let let's do the yeah, show right. 192, Becky. I've just got a, a quick thing to do, and I'll be back in a second. Done and done. Okay, look, we were talking about um, Operation High Jump, and we shared a few things with you, um, a, a few um, uh, the the initially the the official history and so forth. But now let's um, jump back into the maybe more occluded or occulted uh, history, the things that we weren't told. So uh, the so you know we 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 were starting off uh, where we left off last week. Um, Operation High Jump. High jump was underway. We're talking about 1947 here, right? The task force had um, over 40 ships, including the flagship Mount Olympus, the aircraft carrier Philippine Scene, the seaplane tender uh, Pine Sea, uh, the submarine Sennet, the destroyer Bronson, the icebreaker Northwind, and other tank and supply ships, and some 4,700 troops. Um, you know, so and, and there were also three dog sled teams. Uh, in case you're wondering, now all of this was meant to um, uh, uh, was meant to uh, uh, work towards establishing a base at the South Pole. From to my to my mind, a complete overkill. But but nonetheless, there we are. The expedition was in fact filmed by the Navy and brought to Hollywood to be made into a commercial film called This Secret Land. It was narrated by Hollywood actor Robert Montgomery, um, who was in fact. Um, the um, father of the Bevich uh, star, um, Elizabeth Montgomery, and who was himself an officer in the Naval Reserve. Now, it seems incredible, though, that so shortly after a war that had uh, decimated most of Europe and uh, crippled global economies, an expedition to Antarctica was undertaken with so much haste. I mean, it was, it was, it was really um, uh, quite, a, quite a quick undertaking that they... And, and for the size of it, it was actually very fast how they put it together. And now, it took, also it took advantage of the first available Antarctic summer after the war. The first available Antarctic summer after the war, yeah? Um, at such cost and uh, with so much military hardware, unless the operation was absolutely essential to the security of the United States, it would not have been undertaken. Right, so so we're talking about massive cost. We're talking about the first available uh, Antarctic summer after war, World War II. We're talking about here, of course, and and so it was it was all done very quickly, yeah, very very quickly with a lot of uh, with a lot of men and material, right? And and that, that's that's the one thing that I find um, uh, most interesting, right? Uh, also, you have to understand that uh, Russia would not have posed a direct th uh, um, a, a threat to uh, a, a um, I guess, uh, uh, the United States, at least from the South Pole. I mean, the North Pole is a different story, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, um, uh, both Russia, <coughs> in fact, Siberia and Kamchatka, and, and, and Alaska and Canada, uh, connect, or, you know, very uh, separated only a little bit by the Bering Strait. So, so going to the North Pole and, and establishing a base there or near there or, you know, something like that, that makes sense if, you are, if you're um, trying to ward off the Russians, which were, in 1947, the enemy. 
right? This is what this was the beginning of the Cold War. The South Pole, on the other hand, uh, the, the the countries that sort of border the South Pole are Australia and uh, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, and Argentina. Like you know, down at the like the tips of the African the. Um, the So, um, not not really something that is uh, uh, immediately on the radar of the Americans. I would have thought. I mean, you have to really look at this geographically, um, and and it, it is hard for me to understand why they would have put together such a huge expeditionary force <coughs> uh, so quickly, and and with that target. So that's that's something to ponder, guys. Right? Um, and Easy P, yeah. Look, I am still a big guy, right? Uh, I just uh, haven't been to the gym as often as I should. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do have some training. Um, well, I'm, I'm not trained in MMA. I have some some little training. This is the interplay we have with the Tretron, by the way, guys. Now, at the time of the operation, the U.S. Navy itself was being uh, uh, taken apart piece by piece as the battle tested fleet was decommissioned with its uh, mostly civilian crew uh, bidding farewell to the seas forever. The Navy was even reduced to further recruitment to man the few remaining ships in service. Yeah? That's true. Okay, so so <laughs> so this is this is this is again. It, it's it's a little odd as to you have to piece it all together. So uh, tensions across the globe are also mounting as Russia and America edged into a cold war, as I said, uh, possibly a third world war, which was uh, uh, avoided. Some believe, uh, you know, uh, when we had this uh, uh, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and, and a few other times after that, you know, it was a the, the, the Berlin drop, I don't know if you guys recall this, there was this airlift campaign to supply uh, West Berlin with goods. Anyway, um, and, and uh, World War, that the US would have to fight with tragically few ships and tragically half-trained men. So, so the Navy was not really in, in good shape. Now, this, this made the sending of nearly 5,000 residual Navy personnel to a remote part of the planet, where so much uh, danger lurked in the form of icebergs, blizzards, and sub-zero temperatures, even more of a puzzle. I agree. I agree. So this is really strange. Um, the operation was also launched with incredible speed in a matter of weeks, right? I mentioned this. Uh, perhaps it was not. Um, it would not be uncharitable to conclude that the Americans had some unfinished business connected with the war in the polar regions. Indeed, indeed. This was later confirmed by other events and the operation's leader, Admiral Richard Byrd himself. Dave. Yeah, the, look, all I want to say is that the, the repurposing of all of the military kit immediately at the, at the end of the war when f when the best available conditions would be to get down there and do this, there had to be a high priority on that. Seriously high priority, get them down there. Would you agree? Because yeah. I'm, I'm, that's, that's where I'm favouring. Mm. You know, the official instructions Completely. issued by... The, the then Chief of Naval Operations, Chester W. Nimitz, as we've mentioned in the previous show, were to A, train personnel and test material in the frigid zones, B, consolidate and extend American sovereignty over the largest practical area of the Antarctic continent, C, to determine the feasibility of establishing and maintaining bases in the Antarctic and to investigate possible base sites. D. To develop techniques for ex establishing and maintaining air bases on the ice with particular attention to latter applicability of such techniques to Greenland in the Northern Hemisphere. And E. Amplify existing knowledge of hydrographic, geographic, geological, meteorological, and electromagnetic conditions in the area. Little other information was released to the media about the mission, although most journalists were suspicious, as Mekki and I are, of <laughs> its true purpose given the huge amount of military hardware involved, as I mentioned in my preface. The U.S. Navy also strongly emphasized that Operation High Jump was going to be a Navy show. Admiral Ramsey's preliminary orders of the 26th of August 1946 stated that the Chief of Naval Operations will only deal with the governmental agencies and that no diplomatic negotiations are required. No foreign observers will be accepted. Not exactly an invitation to scrutiny, even from the other arms of the government. 
Some facts, however, are well known. There were three divisions of Operation High Jump, one land group with tractors, explosives and plenty of equipment to refurbish Little America, and make an airstrip to land the six RD, sorry, R4Ds, or the DC-3s, as, as we all know them. That's the, um, the, the old uh, workhorse. The, uh, and two seaplane groups, the R4Ds, were fitted with Jet Assist Takeoff Bottles, or JATOs, in order to take off from short runway of the aircraft carrier, the Philippine Sea. They were also fitted with large skis for landing on ice field prepared for them. The skis were specially fitted at three inches above the surface of the carrier deck. When landing on the ice at Little America, the three inches of tyre in contact with the snow and ice provided just enough and not too much drag for a smooth landing. Mackie. Um, yes, uh, following its arrival at Antarctica, the force began uh, reconnaissance of the continent. Uh, Bird himself was on board the first of the planes to take off on January 29, 1947. <clears throat> Rocket propulsion tubes, uh, the JATA bottles uh, Dave mentioned, had been attached to the side of the aircraft and the carrier was maneuvered uh, for a 35 mile per hour run to help get the planes airborne. <clears throat> so, you know, the, you have to fast the starting point. Uh, from the vibration of the uh, great uh, carrier, Bird uh, later wrote, I knew when the captain had got the ship up to about 30 knots, which is roughly about 35 miles per hour maximum, full emergency speed for such a vessel. <clears throat> we seemed to creep along the deck at first, and it looked as if we would never make it. Uh, but when uh, our four J2 bottles went off along the sides of the plane with a terrific deafening noise, I could see the deck quickly fall away. I knew we had made it. Admiral Byrd's team of uh, six RD4s were fitted with the then super secret uh, Trimetricon. <laughs> Trimetricon. <laughs> cool word. Uh, spy cameras, and each plane was trailing a magnetometer. Magnetometer. It's like, you know, like this is like um, X Men. You've got uh, Trimetricon, and you've got a magnetometer. <laughs> the aircraft flew over as much of the continent as they could in the short three month summer period. Again, you have to understand that the, the summer and, and winter months are different in the, uh, in the extreme uh, uh, latitudes. Mm -hmm. And mapping and recording magnetic data. They also carried magnetometers show uh, anomalies in the Earth's magnetism. For example, if there is a hollow place under the surface, ice or ground, it will show up on the meter. Aha! Yeah. That's maybe exactly right. A hollow right. place, you know, maybe like a... <laughs> On the last of many mapping flights, uh, where all six planes uh, went out, each on certain preordained uh, paths to film and measure with magnetometers, Admiral Byrd's plane returned three hours late. Hmm. Officially, it was stated that he had lost an engine and had had to throw everything overboard except the films that themselves and the results of the magnetometer readings in order to maintain altitude long enough to return to Little America. Little America. If we are to believe the published and private accounts of what actually took place, this is almost certainly the time when he met with representatives of the Aryan extraterrestrials and a contingent of the German scientists working on the reverse engineering and construction of flying disks. Wow. Eki, I just want to say something there, right? Um, uh, it, that seems consistent with the amount of time it would take three hours that's a that's really a long time that's a diplomatic hello isn't it yeah yeah mm. i know right yeah mm. and he claimed to have flown in at one point so uh, over the next four weeks the plane spent 220 hours in the air flying a total of 22,700 miles and taking some 70,000 aerial photographs that's pretty heavily photographed that's more than mars you know then um, then the mission that had been expected to last for between six to eight months came to an early and faltering end. The Chilean press reported that the mission had run into trouble and that there had been many fatalities. However, the official record states that one plane crashed, killing three men, a fourth man had perished on the ice, two helicopters had gone down, although the crews had been rescued, and a task force commander was nearly lost. That means nothing happened to him in the end. 
it is an <laughs> indisputable fact that the central group of Operation High Jump were evacuated by the Burton Island icebreaker from the Bay of Wales above, uh, we would even pitch it above, um, on the 22nd of February 1947. Um, the Western group headed home on the 1st of March 1947, and the Eastern group did likewise on the 4th of March, a mere eight weeks after arrival. But they were destined to be... They had a whole other month to go. Eight, no, eight months instead mm -hmm. of, th of that short time. In the end, the task force came steaming back to the United States with their data, which then immediately became classified top secret. Why? I mean, it's meant to be uninhabited, right, Mekki? Secretary exactly. of the Navy, by this time Secretary of Defense... Gee, he's got a... Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, an increase in his role, hasn't he? James Forrestal retired now and started to talk not only about high jump but on about other things as well. He was put in um, Beth Bethesda Naval Hospital psychiatric ward where he was prevented from seeing or talking to anyone, including his wife and after a short while, he was thrown out the window while trying to hang himself with a bedsheet. So the story goes. <laughs> it was, of course, ruled a suicide. Case closed. However, some of what he knew about High Jump, about Roswell, and other things did manage to leak. How much is truth? How much is speculation? It's difficult to tell. However, in every myth, there is a grain of truth. That's correct. Now, guys, I, I want you to recall as well that uh, Admiral Byrd himself was uh, put away into a hospital uh, and when he came back to the States as well and was prevented from speaking to anyone, not just uh, James Forrestal. Okay, mm. and then James Forrestal, of course, was suicided, <coughs> which is a very popular way to get rid of people. Um, you know, oh, suicide, oh, yeah, clearly. Yes. No indications previous, but let's just believe that. However, this much is certain. As incredible as it may sound, there is considerable supporting evidence for these claims about a German base in Antarctica. On the very eve of the Second World War, the Germans themselves had invaded part of Antarctica and claimed it for the Third Reich. Okay, so we're talking about the late 1930s. In fact, Hitler had authorized several expeditions to the Poles shortly before World War II. <laughs> Again, mid, uh, mid to late 30s. Their stated objective was to either, either to rebuild and enlarge Germany's whaling fleet <clears throat> or test out weaponry in severely hostile conditions. Yet if true, all of this could have been achieved at the North Pole rather than at both poles and would have been much closer to home for Germany. Much, much closer. In fact, you would have to traverse the entire world <laughs> to get to the South Pole <laughs> for Germany, whereas the North Pole is a relative hip, a skip, a hop and jump away. Uh, you know, if you look at it that way. Now, anyway, for some reason, however, the Germans had long held an interest in the South Polar regions of with the first uh, Germanic research of that area being undertaken in 1873 when uh, Sir Eduard uh, Dahlmann, who lived from 1830 to 1896, discovered new Antarctic routes with his ship um, um, that I don't know what it was called. <laughs> and during that expedition of the, uh, uh, for the German polar... Um, also, it was called the Greenland. The Greenland. It was called oh, the, the Greenland. Greenland. Also achieved the distinction... Elf being the first steamer to operate in southern uh, in the southern ocean. Sorry, the, so the ship that uh, Dahlmann uh, um, uh, 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 captained was called the Grönland. Grönland, which is really Greenland uh, for you Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> and that was his expedition to place in the early. Sorry, go ahead. And, and that was his expedition for the German Polar Navigation Company of Hamburg. That is correct. That is correct. That's exactly right. And the first expedition took place in the early years of the 20th century uh, in the ship uh, called the Gauss, <clears throat> which became embedded in the ice for 12 months. 12 months, that's a long, long time. And then a further expedition took place in 1911 under the command of Wilhelm Filchner with his ship the Deutschland, which of course means Germany. Between the wars, though, uh, the Germans made a further voyage in 1925 with a sp <clears throat> specially designed ship for the polar regions, the Meteor, under the command of Dr. Albert Merz. And there is the break, and do not forgive... Is it the, was it the music? Yep. Yes. Please donate, guys. Donate. Listen to Supporter Radio here. 
Yeah, listen to supported radio. We'll see you on the other side of the break. It's only a short break. There'll be questions afterwards. Use the time to donate. Revolution Radio. We're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. By a civil majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case of more Be quiet. I order you to be quiet. Look, you stupid bastard. You've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look. It's just a flesh wound. I don't believe I'm seeing such a display of courage, skill, nerve, grace, and stupidity. I'll do you for that. What? Come here. What are you going to do? Bleed on me? I'm invincible. You're a loony. A black knight always triumphs. Roundtable Live, Monday through Friday, 1 a.m. till 4 a.m. Eastern Time. Bring your mind, bring your ideas, bring your voice. King Arthur had nothing on us. Here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Is your data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over three gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records, addresses, phone numbers? Well, squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us, we're already here. And Welcome back to the second half of Dave and Mackie's Shiny Set Out <laughs> and to the <clears throat> to the uh, hard rendering bonus rendition of that wonderful <laughs> song. Dave, doesn't it feel like it does feel like deja vu? Woo, wrong show though, right? Yeah, <laughs> like this, no, this show's about Run. high jump, Operation High Jump. <laughs> Groundhog Day. <laughs> Get up, you camera. What was it? It's cold out it's there. Cold it's outside, cold outside there, there campers. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's it. Um, yeah, no, there's no uh, ground dog here. We, we, uh, I think, um, because it is daylight saving for the States, uh, I think, the, yeah, this weekend so, for you guys. What, what it's so done, don't forget, it's, yeah, it's, don't forget to uh, put your time. Uh, is fall it, back. For those guys, it's back, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Fall back. Your, your Spring pursuit. forward, <clears throat> fall back, wherever you are on the planet, that, ha- that, that supports <laughs> daylight saving. Remember, it's not plural. It's daylight saving, not savings. There's no, C, there's no S. And... Um, uh, there was a, a very funny, I can't have to mention this, very funny YouTube clip of uh, that the comedy uh, group have put together about daylight saving. It is quite funny. I recommend you see it. Uh, they, it's it's uh, all done like the trailer of a movie. 
And in the end, you know, this girl's going, I don't know what's happening. And she's, she's <laughs> screaming and sc- shooting uh, an Uzi just blankly, you know, you don't see who she's sh- trying to shoot at, but it looks like she's trying to, to kill people is to fix it. It's very funny. <laughs> because <laughs> that's what works you know clearly killing people fixes everything right yeah there's, there's a couple no no it doesn't there's a couple of <laughs> investigators that are looking into the conspiracy of it who end up making out because it looks like it's the end of the world it's very funny and, and one group of people want to move no, we, we, can, we can go we can we can just run, we can we can move to nevada or whoever it is utah they don't have daylight saving no, you're just running away from your problems. And then this conspiracy <laughs> conspiracy guy says, you know, it's it's the establishment trying to control you. It's all mind control. It's very funny. It's They've done such a good job with it. It's well scripted, well acted, and well filmed. So um, keep an eye out for it. Look, just on that though, guys, you should really move to Australia and live in the future, future, future. Yeah. That's what you, should. you know, <laughs> we do come from the, we are in the future. I have to tell you, your tomorrow, oh, yes. well, the, the, the day that you're currently experiencing is going to be awesome. But we're not allowed to talk about it too much. There's like a whole bunch of time, you know, protocols. Yeah. Relating, so guys can't really ta- talk about it. But, but, you know, clearly we're still here. So you will be here tomorrow as well, right? That, that's clearly uh, not right. No, I, <laughs> completely I, wrong. Anyway. Act, actually, I was going to keep perpetuating that, Mickey. That sounded great. <laughs> you see, I, I didn't, but, I didn't do this. <laughs> Yes, as, I could as have long done as the that. situation is not severious, it's all good. Yeah, severe, um, that's right. <laughs> severe. Now, um, I'm going to do a couple more paragraphs here, and then uh, Dave, because uh, you might not know where we are. And now, between the wars, the Germans made a further voyage in 1925 with a specially designed ship for the polar regions, the Meteor, under the command of Dr. Albert Merz. Then, in the years directly preceding the Second World War, the Germans lay claim to parts of Antarctica in order to set up a permanent base there. This is not conspiracy theory, that's what actually happened. Given that no country actually owned the continent and couldn't exactly be conquered as no one lived there, during the winter months at least, it appeared to the Germans that the most effective way to conquer part of the continent was to physically travel there, claim it, let others know of their actions and await any disagreements. Pretty much what Hitler did in Sudetenland, Austria, and when he crossed the Rhine. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's like a Hitler's uh, more and, and Poland there. Uh, Captain Alfred, <laughs> sorry, go on. And po- I'm just making a joke. In Poland, yeah. In Poland, yes, yes. <laughs> they, well, they 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 fired first, so that's that's normal. Apparently, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Captain Alfred. Uh, since uh, 4 a.m. this morning, uh, we are now shooting back. <laughs> yeah, clearly you are. <laughs> Captain Alfred Richard was chosen to lead the proposed strike. He had already led expeditions to the North Pole and had proved himself in adverse and critical situations. For the mission, Richer was given the Schwabenland, a German aircraft carrier that had been used for transatlantic mail deliveries by special flight boats, the famous 10-ton Dornier Super Wals since 1934. A Wal is actually a whale, so Dornier Super Whales. These whales were launched by catapult from the Schwabenland and had to be accelerated to 93 miles per hour before they could become airborne. So this is how the Germans uh, solved that problem, uh, catapult, uh, you know, because aircraft carriers clearly have very short runways. Mm-hmm. At the end of each flight, a crane on the ship lifted the aircraft back on board after they had landed in the sea. Um, you know, again, same problem, different approaches. Ge- the Americans did quite a different thing there. And the ship was refitted for the expedition in the shipyards of Hamburg and around 1 million Reichsmark, 1 million Reichsmark, and nearly a third of the entire expedition budget was spent on this particular refit alone. The crew was prepared for the mission by the German Society of Polar Research, and these preparations need completion. The organization invited Admiral Byrd to address them, which he did. The Schwabenland... Prior yes. to the war, guys. Prior That's to the right. War, right. The Schwabenland <laughs> left the port of Hamburg on the 17th of December, 1938, and followed a precisely planned and determined route towards the southern continent. In little over a month, the ship arrived, arrived at the ice-covered Antarctica, dropping anchor um, at a particular degrees, and if you want uh, to refer to those, you can look at the show notes, uh, on January um, 20, 1939. <laughs> The expedition then spent three weeks off Princess Astrid Coast and Princess Martha Coast off Queen Maud Land. During these weeks, the two Schwabenland aircraft, the Passat and Boreas, flew 15 missions across 600,000 square kilometres of Antarctica. 
taking more than 11,000 pictures of the area with their specific, sorry, specially designed, um, which one's that? Zeiss. Zeiss. Oh, yeah, he still makes lenses. There's still lenses under his name. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, the Zeiss Runmus uh, build cameras, the RMK38, is that 38B? No, 38. 38. Okay, 38. Oh, I see. That's a font issue. Okay, nearly right. one fifth of Antarctica was. Um, oh, Mackie, what's that? Uh, uh, that's that's uh, reconnoitered. Uh, it's it's a, it's uh, a 19th century word re meaning a, a reconnaissance. Uh, they did reconnaissance uh, yes. over that. <laughs> reconnoitered. <laughs> I, I didn't know whether that was going to get bleeped or not. <laughs> no, 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 no body parts in this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you hear, if you ever heard that, hear the term reconnoitered, uh, I might use that at work tomorrow. Find a way to bring that in. Reconnoitered. Yeah. The the, the servers were reconnoitered. Um, I did some reconnoitering in the computer room. Uh, <laughs> don't fire me on the spot. I swear. Okay. So nearly one fifth of Antarctica. Antarctica. Um, had reconnaissance covering its uh, surface area. It's actually elegant the way it's put. In this way, and for the first time, ice-free areas with lakes and signs of vegetation were discovered. This area was then declared, declared to be under the control of the German expedition, renamed Mecki, the New, New Schwabenland, New Schwabenland mm. which is. Uh, Nuswebia. Yeah. And hundreds, hundreds of small stakes carrying the swastika were dumped on the snow-covered ground for the whales. To from, from the from, whales. From, from the whales. Yeah. They're, they're, they're the aircraft. To signal the new ownership. Uh, Richter and Schwabenland left the newly claimed territory in the middle of February 1939 and returned to Hamburg two months later, complete with the photographs and maps of the German acquisition. Mecki. Yeah. Now, just, just before we go on, think about this way, guys. Now, I, I, I firmly believe that the uh, Germans had discovered something uh, in, in, in Tibet, may, maybe in, in other parts of, of uh, the Himalayas, I don't know, somewhere in the Middle East as well. And <clears throat> so they, they then went ahead and went to uh, uh, the Antarctic, right, to, to the South Pole, because something uh, <clears throat> sent them there in a way, if you will. I believe firmly, and I'm here with uh, Jan and uh, Rand Flem, uh, Flem Rand, I think the names are the, the researchers, that, that Atlantis, or, or you know, the, the preceding civilization, may very well have been uh, centralized or situated on the Antarctic uh, and whatever destroyed it and you know clearly changed the climate maybe even toppled the poles I don't know whatever but uh, clearly it destroyed whatever civilization Antarctica had at that point and the Germans uh, and maybe not just the Germans but the Germans uh, maybe in, in, in more recent times found evidence for that in the other expeditions that they had launched prior to that and the German uh, Nazi party and the Nazis you know the Tulu uh, society we spoke about as well the Vril society they, they were obsessed with going east and looking for ancient knowledge and so forth so I think uh, the, um, the the journey to uh, Antarctica was, was uh, uh, interesting on many layers and I think a, a number of different uh, agendas were being pursued here however let's let's keep on going now bear in mind uh, that all of this took place before uh, the recovery of the uh, UFO in the Bavarian Alps in 1938. And there's no conceivable reason, at least on the surface, for such an intense interest in the South Polar regions. Like I've just outlined, I think I, 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 I have a, a certain theory there. Unless something else had already transpired to make such an investigation worthwhile. The true purpose of this expedition has never been satisfactorily explained. There's merely a series of puzzles, related reports and snippets of information that are no longer open to verification. What is not open to doubt, however, is that in the decade preceding the Second World War, the Germans did almost nothing that did not put, that did not put the entire structure of the country on a war footing. So, in fact, uh, yeah, this is true. Hitler built a war economy, economy to, to uh, ostensibly um, bring Germany out of the, the catastrophic uh, depression it was uh, in. And, you know, they were running battles in the street. My grandparents used to tell me between the Schupo, the, the, po the police, and, and the um, this was pre uh, Nazi times, and and the unemployed, and also the, the the huge amount of veterans that returned from World War uh, One uh, home without any jobs. Germany was bankrupted after the Versailles Treaty, so Hitler, in order to to uh, get the uh, German economy going again, uh, he started a war economy. You know, so that's why Nazism is really a corporate fascism. It's it's really uh, a, a rule by the corporate. 
blades and, and the military industrial complex. And it's not America that invented it. It's, it's really Germany that, that came up with the concept of the military industrial complex, which in fact uh, helped uh, Hitler rise to power. So, but, but let's think about this for a second. We've, we've discussed this, Dave. I want you to, to think about this as well. So Germany goes to the Antarctic, the most unlikely place uh, for it to go. It, it really is. It just doesn't make any sense. Right? I mean, geographically speaking, it doesn't. Unless, of course, they had found something, like I said earlier. They had found something somewhere else that pointed them to the Antarctic. And then, and then after the war, clearly the Allies, or the Americans at the very least, uh, certainly the Russians, I would imagine, but, but certainly the Americans found some documents, I would imagine, found some research, found something, had, had people come across uh, under Operation Paperclip, whatever it may be, and they realized, oh, we better go to the Antarctic as well. We better get there quick smart, right? Mm. Because the war was just over and the Navy was, no, 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 the Navy was in bad shape, to put it, to put it uh, mildly. Let's get there quick smart. Let's send 5,000 guys, three, three battleship groups, not one, three battleship mm -hmm. groups, and, and take this latest technology that can find hollows underground. So it's almost like almost ground penetrating radar in a way, not, not not really, but but you know what I'm talking about. So so they can find underground bases. So clearly, some information fell into the Allies' hands or Americans specifically. Actually, Canadians, New Zealanders, and so forth were also part, and Australians were part of this expedition. Let's not forget this, right? So there's like there's a whole a whole Anglo-Saxon uh, contingent that went down there, not just the not just the Americans. Anyway, so so they found something. So the Americans found something. Sorry, the Germans found something first. Went there established bases, then the Americans found out what the Germans had found out and went there, real quick smart. And it seems, though, that whatever the Americans were looking for, they, they, they found, but they were repelled. They were, you know, uh, they were uh, denied access, whatever. And they quickly uh, turned tail and fled the area. And, and they've been treated since then. Nobody should go to Antarctica, la, 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 whatever. There are a couple of uh, research stations there, but nobody has really gone and launched a massive operation of this nature, of this size, since then. The Americans never went back with such a large battle group. And I have to nobody, tell you... Nobody else says... I, I, have, I have to tell you as well, I mean, that's an awfully large... But mm. Just to, to have one carrier group, that's yep. one thing. Just to have a couple of ships go down with some planes, or whatever, that's something else. But to send almost all of the naval hardware that you've got down there, that just seems um, it seems ridiculous to no, I, I, to fund for what for what purpose? Just for an experiment? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't think that's the case. I think they were, I think Becky's right. I think they were they were going to put the end to something either what the Germans had found uh, or to take it over to claim it as mm. theirs or to engage in something. Yeah. So you you have you have two expeditions that can't be explained uh, rationally. Two, the Germans and mm -hmm. then the Americans. Mm -hmm. Two, right? So this is this is really uh, this is really the the conundrum. This is really the the question here. I mean, uh, if if it if it smells like uh, fish and it looks like fish, tastes like fish, it's probably fish. So I think something fishy is going on here, right? <laughs> to put it um, to put it bluntly. Um, mm -hmm. And again, unless you go there yourself and you have some uh, some money behind you, um, which allows you to reconnoiter in a sensible way. <laughs> I'm going to use that word a lot now. Um, Rem then, remember uh, that access is limited, though, Mickey. Well, that's the thing, right? Mm. Now, see, people have to be kept out of um, um, out of uh, Pine Gap. People have to be kept out of uh, Area 51. People have to be kept out of a whole bunch of other areas, right? In, in, on the, because they're fairly accessible. You know, if, if you can drive there, you can take a train, whatever. This, though... The, the Antarctic, not so accessible. There's no commercial flights. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no city that you can visit, like, no mm -hmm. tourism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so either you're a scientist or you're some part, uh, part of a military contingent or whatever it might be. But unless, um, and th there are some cruises that go there, but they, they sort of, you know, coast along the shore. It's un highly unlikely that anybody would ever go there by accident, <laughs> right? Dave, you, you just don't, you don't, you don't end up there. You don't, even, even on purpose, it's very hard to get to, right? Even on purpose. Cor correct. Remember, there was an Air, Le Air New Zealand crash. Mm -hmm. they, there was a, 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 a commercial flight that flew over it just to show people what was going on. And they say it crashed. Maybe it was shot down. Yeah, possibly. A foul play, Absolutely. maybe. Yeah, uh, hey, um, you got you know, too it's, close. It's, it's, Sorry about that. Yeah. You know? In fact, the, the closest the Americans are to the South Pole is uh, Diego Garcia. Think about that.
Wow. Okay. Think about that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, this activity affected all aspects of German life, military, civilian, economic, social, and foreign policy airing industry and so forth. Given that the seizing of New Schwabenland occurred on the very eve of the war, it can only be concluded that that polar expedition was of major importance and significance to the goals and development of the German nation. So, they waited. And let's make no mistake here, Poland did not attack Germany, okay? Let's put that to rest right here. Didn't happen. <laughs> did not happen. The, the Poles, they, they did not in 19... 38 attacked Germany and Germany was not forced to shoot back. <laughs> okay, so whatever had to happen in, in in Arctia happened, and when it had happened, I guess Germany then felt um, <clears throat> um, sufficiently secure. Not Germany, I should say, but the you know, the leadership to start World War II. Again, they didn't really think. I I I don't think that Hitler thought this would escalate to World War II. Because you have to realize, prior to, to the, the Polish expedition, let's call it, uh, uh, and in fact, even during it, Germany had taken the Sudetenland, which was part of uh, uh, Slovakia, yeah, or, or the Czech Republic, um, largely German. So they had taken that back into, into Germany, repatriated. Uh, Austria was repatriated into the Greater Reich with, with no, with no uh, consequences. Um, in fact, he also uh, remilitarized uh, the... Um, the Rhine, the, the, the French side of the Rhine. So he, he went across the bridge. At each of these junctures, Hitler was ready to pull back immediately had there been any opposition from the uh, um, Allied uh, uh, forces, uh, France, Great Britain, and so forth, you know, the, the, the victors of World War I. But there wasn't. The, the policy was to um, appease Hitler. That was the policy, to appease him. And let's, let's not forget that uh, when, when Germany attacked Poland, uh, the Germans had a, a pact <clears throat> with Russia, with Stalin. It was called the, the Steel Pact, the Stahl Pact, um, uh, uh, which, which split Poland between uh, Germany and Russia. Now, after that, things escalated, and maybe Hitler became too um, confident. Maybe the Blitzkrieg notion, you know, uh, came to, went to his head uh, because he, he he went through Europe like a hot knife through butter, right? Let's not make, let's make no mistake. He 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 went real quick. And uh, and uh, he conquered France. You know, he he, he took uh, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, <clears throat> Italy was on his side, North Africa. You know, it all, all went his way uh, rather quickly. He went into the Balkans as well rather quickly, and then he made the mistake, in my opinion, uh, and and went into Russia. You can't win a land war in Asia. You cannot listen to this. You cannot win a land war in Asia. Doesn't happen. Can't do it. Don't start one, okay? All the Russians have to do is withdraw, if need be, all the way to Kamchatka. And, and it's, uh, that's essentially what they did. I mean, uh, Hitler did take uh, uh, Moscow. So what? Big deal. Um, uh, he was, he was uh, destroyed at Stalingrad. Uh, uh, the Sixth Army was completely destroyed. In fact, my granduncle, my, my grandmother's uh, uh, brother, was in, in, in Stalingrad uh, as part of the Sixth Army, and he spent, uh, I think, 13 years in Siberia, one of the few survivors of that conflict. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's horrendous. So, so don't start a land war in Asia. But he did. He became overconfident and whatever. So, so, but let's be clear here that up until this point, Germany didn't really expect this to escalate into a, a world war necessarily, right? I don't even think Hitler anticipated uh, the size of the conflict he would eventually um, uh, uh, have to fight. He wanted to build his fortress Europe up, Normandy and along the French uh, coast there, the coastline into, into, into um, uh, northern Europe as well. The, those fortifications hadn't been finished by the time the Allied invasion came in 1944. The fortifications were only half finished. So, okay, so again, wind back uh, to, to 1938. Uh, I don't think that Hitler thought this would escalate the way it did. But, but whatever happened in, Ar in, in Antarctica, satisfied him that he was now in a position to start a war. All right, this is important. This is very, very important. Now, um, nor did the activity end with the outbreak of the war. All right? In fact, it intensified. The South Atlantic, including South Polar Waters, became quite active. Dave, how active became, did they become? Between 1939 and 1941, well after the outbreak of, world, uh, of war in Europe, Captain Bernhard... Roger of the Commerce Raider Atlantis made an extended voyage in the South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Pacific Oceans, and visited the uh, the uh, what's that Isles Kerguelen? Yeah, Kerguelen Islands. Yep. There you go. Between 
December 1940, January 1941. The Atlantis is known to have been visited by an RFC-2, the UFO-style craft which has served as a reconnaissance aircraft since late 1940. The ship then adopted a new guise as Tamasus uh, before being sunk by HMS Devonshire near Ascension Island on the 22nd of November 1941. Although the activities of the German ship Erlangen under the captaincy of Alfred Grams, did not appear to be one of consequence during 1939 and 1940. The same cannot be said of the comet, which, that's comet with a K, which was commanded by Captain Robert uh, Eisen, following her passage along the northern sea route in 1940. This commerce radar operated in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, including a voyage along the Antarctic coastline from Cape Adair <coughs> to the Shackleton Ice Shelf in search of whaling vessels during 1941. There she met the, um, is that Penguin? Or the Penguin? Yep. Penguin? Penguin, yeah, yep. Penguin, yep. Uh, and supply vessels, uh, Alster, Alst, hang on, I'll get it, Alster, 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 and Adjunct. Comet was sunk off the Jurburg, uh, off Jurburg in 1942. Mackie. Uh, the Penguin itself, under the command of uh, Captain Ernst Felix Koda, was a commerce, uh, commerce raider that operated chiefly in the Indian Ocean. In uh, January 1941, she captured a Norwegian whaling fleet, a whole, whole fleet, <laughs> factory ships Olle Vega and Pelagos, supply ship Zolglimt, about um, well, this, this is this is the uh, again the uh, position in the Indian Ocean has been given here. Uh, one of these uh, catches, which was renamed the Adjutant, remained as a tender, and the rest were sent to France. This ship also made anchorages at the uh, Kerguelen Islands, and may have landed a party on Marian Island. Uh, the, the Penguin was sunk off the Persian uh, Gulf by the HMS Cornwall on uh, May 8, 1941, after she had captured <coughs> 106,000 tons of British and Allied shipping. This island of Kerguelen, which is named the most useless island in the world in 1995, <laughs> actually was called that, the most useless island in the world, <laughs> continued to feature prominently in Nazi plans. For example, in 1942, the German Navy planned to establish a meteorological station there. In May of that year, the ship Michel transferred a meteorologist and two radio operators with full equipment uh, to a supply vessel, Charlotte Schliemann, that went uh, onto the island. However, the orders uh, for the station were later countermanded. It is interesting uh, to note that Kerguelen Island was also the center of a mid-19th century mystery. Mid-19th century mystery. Uh, then entirely un uninhabited, except for uh, seals and seabirds, a British captain, uh, Sir James Clark Ross, I mean, he's actually... In Australia, we know him. Uh, landed there in May 1840. He found in the snow unidentifiable traces <coughs> of um, the singular footprints of a pony or ass, being three inches in length and two inches in breadth, having a small, deeper depression on either side and shaped like a horseshoe. Similar markings appeared overnight in the Devon area of England 15 years later and also have to fight adequate explanation. The Devonshire Devil. Yeah? If you're familiar with that particular uh, crypto uh, creature or cryptoid, the Devonshire Devil we're talking about here, it appeared on this island before it appeared in the Devon area. Did it maybe stow away on the ship of this good Captain Ross? Is that a possibility? I think it might be. Uh, then in 1942, Captain Gerlach in his ship, the Stier, investigated nearby Gauf Island as a possible temporary base for raiders and a camp for prisoners. This, shi this ship activity does not appear considerable. However, the level of U-boat activity in the, South Atlantic, in the South Atlantic was much higher. The exact nature and extent of how high will probably be never be known. You know, those records are lost. However, some insight might be gleaned from the fact that between October 1942 and September 1944, that's two years, 16 German U-boats were sunk in the South Atlantic area. And some of the submarines did appear to be engaged in covert activities, Dave. Mm. A fine example of this would be that of the U-859. I'll just call it the U-Bait 859 in future, which 
on 4th of April 1944 at 4.40 hours, left on a mission carrying 67 men and 33 tonnes of mercury sealed in glass bottles in watertight tin crates. The submarine was later sunk on the 23rd of September by British submarine HMS Trenchant in the Straits of Malacca, and although 47 of the crew died, 20 survived. Some 30 years later, some of these survivors spoke openly about the cargo, and divers later confirmed the story on rediscovering the mercury. The significance being that mercury is usable as a fuel source for certain types of aerospace propulsion. Why would a German submarine be transporting such a cargo so far from home? It is not odd at all if one considers that the fact that aviation, or avionics, construction is what the polar base seems to be all about. Although Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allies on the 8th of May 1945, events after that date suggested something was happening that did not form a part of the recognised world history. Remember, each of our countries has its own version of history. Mm -hmm. Something fueled by a state of a statement made by German Grand Admiral Karl well, Dunitz, Dunitz um, mm -hmm. the 16th of September 1891, um, 24th of December 1980. What's that? I That's don't when know. he died. Oh, so I see. He was born. Yeah, oh, born I see. That death. was his born. Yeah, was... <laughs> okay. There's, there's a funny character on, on our show notes um, that doesn't display on my screen. Um, had become commander of the German Kriegsmarine, or the Navy, on the 31st of January, 31st of January 1943, and had led the German U-boat fleet until the end of the Second World War. He also has the distinct uh, the distinction of briefly becoming head of the German state for 20 days after Hitler's death or disappearance, until his um, own capture by the Allies on the 23rd of May 1945. His contribution to the mystery of post-war Antarctic activity came in a statement he made in 1943 when he declared that a substantial portion of the German submarine fleet had been rebuilt in another part of the world in Shang Shangri-La land, an impregnable fortress. Could, have been, could he have been referring to the alleged base in Antarctica? Mackie. Indeed. Now, now before we uh, go on, I want you to, to direct your attention very quickly to the mercury uh, mystery. Now, <clears throat> if, you, if you're familiar with ancient Indian uh, Vedic texts, you understand that the Vimana craft were in fact fueled by mercury and another substance called orichalco, which we haven't identified yet, but which Dave and I believe to be white gold powder, mm -hmm. immaterial at this point. However, mercury was definitely something that was uh, fueling those Vimana. Now, if we I go back to my earlier assumption that the Germans had found something in the east, in the far east, in fact, or in India, whatever, um, and it had to do maybe with these Vimana, these flying craft, and which are in fact uh, quite detailed um, in in the in 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 the Vedas. They're quite uh, they're described to to a great level of detail, uh, including the fuel, as I said. It, it makes perfect sense that uh, they might be developing those craft and maybe the civilization that had existed prior to the last Ice Age maybe was in fact, uh, 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 you know, maybe the refugees went to the Himalayas. Maybe the Indian culture was started from the refugees uh, from Antarctica. I don't know. The point is, it, 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 all these things link up. Right? The mystery connects. The mystery of, of the mercury, if you will, right? Uh, which is maybe not such a great mystery. Well, now, I, I, just wanna, I just wanna add to everybody, every fluorescent tube whether the small ones you put into a light fitting or the long elongated tubes will only work with a single drop of mercury in them. Mm. The, the lights themselves do not work without them. Just simply passing electricity over phosphorus does not do the job. Does you nothing. must have, it does nothing. There's something about mercury and electricity that does something completely special. Sounds like a catalyst to me, but, you know, what do mm. I know? Um, now, certainly there are records of continued German naval activity in the area after the war had apparently ended. For example, on July 10, 1945, more than two months after the cessation of known hostilities, war's over, the German submarine, sorry, 
the war in Europe is over, the German submarine uh, U-530 surrendered to Argentine authorities. Pfft. Yeah? Two months. So wait, wait, wait. anyway, the background to this event is puzzling. It is known that the boat had left Lorient in France on the 22nd of May 1944 under the captaincy of Otto Wermut for operations in the Trinidad area. This is the Caribbean yeah, there, nice. And after successfully rendezvousing with the incoming Japanese submarine I-52, it headed for Trinidad before finally returning to base after 133 days at sea. The boat's official record states that between October 1944 and May 1945, it formed part of the 33rd Flotilla, and on Germany's surrender, Otto Wermut's captaincy and the submariner's career came to an end. Yet, two months later, it arrived in Rio de la Plata in Argentina and surrendered to the authorities there on July 10, 1945. Hmm. The future may well reveal that fate of uh, more of these, uh, the fate of uh, more of these submarines. However, given the French and South American reports and the number of missing U-boats, it may not be unreasonable to conclude that at least some of them relocated to the South Pole area. History also gives us further clues as to a German Antarctica connection. For it records that Hans Ulrich Hodel of the German Luftwaffe was being groomed by Hitler to be his successor. It is known that Rudel made frequent trips to Tierra del Fuego, which is a uh, fireland at the very southern tip of Argentina, um, nearest Antarctica, in fact. And one of Martin Bormann's last messages from the bunker in Berlin to Dönitz also mentioned Tierra del Fuego, fireland. Hmm. Then... There are also claims about Rudolf Hess, Hitler's best friend who went to England and was arrested as a war criminal on the 10th of May 1941. Following his arrest, Hess was held in Spandau prison in isolation until his death. Such unique treatment is suggestive that he had information that the Allies considered dangerous. Indeed, in his book, Secret Nazi Polar Expeditions, Christoph Friedrich states Hess was entrusted with all important Antarctic files um, and information. Hess himself kept the polar files and uh, now granted such information as Hess possessed, if any, would have been complete only to the time that he took off on his solo flight to England. But that period prior to 1941 would have covered the initial recovery of the Bavarian flying disc and, at the very least, the early stages of any project or projects arising from such a recovery. It would also contain any information with regard to any survivors of the crash and their eventual fates. Many believe that Hess, who had no part in any of the so-called War crimes was deliberately kept in Spandau prison for life in an attempt to keep him quiet. It has also been speculated that the man who died in Spandau prison was, in fact, not Hess at all. That Hess had been murdered years before in an effort to keep the truth on several highly embarrassing matters from getting out. Mackie. That's correct. In fact, uh, he, he only died fairly recently, um, and, 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 he, and maybe we should uh, put this in perspective. A Spandau prison is a fairly large prison, and in the end, the only prisoner in there for a number of years was Hess. So the entire prison was only there to keep Hess inside, hmm. if it was in fact Hess. Right? So that, that just to put it in perspective, and uh, like, like Dave uh, mentioned, he had never been implicated in any of the war crimes. The final solution to the Jewish question uh, was in fact uh, discussed after he had been uh, kept, captured by the British. For the moment, however, uh, let's let's return to uh, Operation High Jump. The Hess matter we can maybe do in another show, which seems to have been an attempt to ferret out a remaining German base on the Antarctic continent, and perhaps to determine where exactly the sudden rash of UFO activity of the past 18 months had originated, and exactly who or what was behind it. There would have, of necessity, been two prerequisites for a mission of this type. Firstly, Operation High Jump would have to provide evidence that the mission included a reconnaissance of Neuschwabenland. 
and secondly, there would have to be an area of the frozen continent that could allow such a base to exist throughout the year. Both of these criteria were met. Both the eastern and western groups of, of Operation High Jump had been active around Neuschwabenland. So two of the three battle groups right, mm. were active around Neuschwabenland. So was a Russian boat that proved to be unfriendly. So uh, like I said earlier, the Russians must have uh, captured some of the information as well after the war. The eastern group were frustrated in their efforts to make a reconnaissance of the area, despite incredible efforts to secure photographs for later examination. However, by then it was very late in the season, meaning winter was approaching. The sun had only been briefly glimpsed in the past few weeks, but everyone could tell that the continually gray skies and clouds were darkening daily. In another month, all light would be gone from Antarctica. The waters girdling the continent would begin to freeze rapidly. Binding unwary ships in a crushing embrace, okay, and uh, and uh, Dufek, the commander, was loath to surrender. He ordered these ships northwards, away from the pack. Perhaps one or two more flights might be possible. But on the morning of March 3, virgin ice was seen to be forming on the waters. Uh, surface, that is. <laughs> and the eastern group steamed out of Antarctica. So as soon as you see the water freezing, the seawater, you know it's time to get out of there because temperatures are dropping rapidly. The, West, the western group, however, were to make a remarkable discovery. At the end of January 1947, a PBM piloted by Lieutenant Commander David Bunger of Colorado, Coronado, sorry, California, flew from his ship, the Karatak, and headed towards the continent's Queen Mary coast. On reaching land, Banga flew west for a time. Then, coming up over the featureless white horizon, he saw a dark, bare area which Bird later described as a land of blue and green lakes and brown hills in an otherwise limitless expanse of ice. Banga and his men carefully uh, reconnoitred the area before racing back to the Currituck with the news of their find. The, way, the oasis as I know when in my uh, upbringing it was described as, they had discovered had covered an area of some 300 square miles of the continent and contained three large open water lakes along with a number of smaller lakes. These lakes were separated by masses of barren, reddish-brown rocks possibly indicating the presence of iron ore. Several days later, Bunga returned to the area and found that the water was warm to the touch and the lake itself was filled with red, blue and green algae, giving it a distinctive colour. Bunga filled a bottle with the water, which later turned out to be brackish, a clue to the fact that the lake was actually an arm of the open sea. This important. This is this is important for two reasons. Warm inland lakes connected to the surrounding oceans would would be perfect for submarines to hide within, and similar lakes have been noted in New Schwabenland, the site of the alleged German and a suspected alien base. Meki, I'll just finish this, and then you can go through the points Absolutely. one by one. Yep, yep. While there is still no conclusive evidence that a German alien base on Antarctica. It is beyond doubt that something highly unusual is happening on or around the frozen continent. In general, it appears that the probability for such a base to have existed and perhaps continue to exist to this day are rather high. The evidence, a large volume of it, is there for all to see. Meki, take the first one, we'll alternate. Absolutely. Firstly, the Germans explored and claimed part of Antarctica on the very eve of the war when the vast majority of their activity was geared towards the rebuilding of the German economy and military infrastructure. This activity began shortly before the recovery of the Bavarian flying disc in 1938, but picked up pace immediately afterward. Now, this is the second point that substantiates this. These are all the points that we know about. There was an ongoing ship and submarine activity in the South Atlantic and polar regions throughout and after the war had apparently ended. 
This activity continued well into the 1950s and, if some accounts are to be believed, continues to this day, with what can only be considered U-boat sightings and a very high incidence of unidentified flying object sightings in the South Atlantic and South Polar regions, including the southern portions of South America. Thirdly, the US literally invaded the continent of Antarctica itself, with considerable naval resources leaving mainland America exposed and vulnerable as the world edged into the Cold War. Very odd. The task force limped home as if defeated only weeks later. This was meant to be several months, eight months, right? This was meant to be, but it came back after four weeks. And the local South American press wrote, in fact, of such a defeat. This coincided with a substantial increase in UFO activity generally attributed to the first major wave of such activity in modern times, with an inordinate amount of this activity taking place in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly in South America. Hmm. Point four. Admiral Byrd spoke of objects that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speed being based on Antarctica. Absolutely. And, and let's be clear, he was not referring to the Russians. Hundreds of thousands, this is point five, of Germans and a minimum of 40, 40 U-boats were missing at the end of the war. Yep, they're just gone. <laughs> Documentation and eyewitness accounts prove that at least a portion of these craft made it as far as South America. In some cases, several months after the end of the war in Europe. Hmm. Now... The connection between Antarctica and the UFO phenomenon was sealed with claims made by one Albert K. Bender, who stated that he went into the fantastic and came up with an answer. And the answer was, I know what the saucers are. Bender ran an organization called the International Flying Saucer Bureau, a small UFO organization based in Connecticut, USA. And he also added a publication known as the Space Review, which was committed to the dissemination of news about UFOs. In truth, the organization had only a small membership and the publication circulated amongst hundreds rather than thousands. But that its members and readers valued it was in little doubt. The publication itself advocated the flying sources were spacecraft of extraterrestrial origin. However, Dave... Mm. In the... Octo in <coughs> Pardon me. No, oh, I'm still not well, by the way. I'm sorry. I apologize, everyone. However, in the October 1953 edition of the Space Review, there were two major announcements. The first was headed Late Bulletin and stated, A source which the IFSB considers very reliable has informed us that the investigation of flying saucer mystery and the solution is approaching final stages. This same source to whom... We had referred data which had come into our possession suggested that it was not the proper method and time to publish the data in Space Review. The second announcement read, Statement of importance. The mystery of the flying sources is no longer a mystery. The source is already known, but the information about this is being withheld by order from a higher source. We would like to print the full story in Space Review, but because of the nature of the information, we are very sorry that we have been advised in the negative. The statement ended in a sentence. We advise those engaged in saucer work to please be very cautious. Mm. They received threats, Mackie, by the sounds of it. <laughs> And, and remember, this is, this is the um, early 1950s. Uh, Roswell is only six years ago, um, the, the Washington incident and so forth, not that long ago either. So this is the beginning, really, of, of earnest research into the UFO phenomenon in the States. These announcements were of little significance in and of themselves. Bender's publication was considered fringe at best, even at the time much like the shiny side out. <laughs> However, what, get, what gained them wider attention was the fact that immediately after publishing this um, October 1953 issue, Bender suspended further publication of the magazine and closed the IFSB down without any further explanation. So as soon as, like these two statements that Dave just shared with us, as soon as that had been published, that edition, 1953 October, the IFSB, which is the International Flying Saucer Bureau, right, Bureau, shut down completely. Hmm. 
Okay, no explanation given. This is completely consistent with the prudent approach shown by many who have been gently warned to cease operations by the Majestic 12 Group and other agencies, for example, involved in keeping a lid on any real investigation into the unidentified flying object phenomenon. Yeah? So, um, and, and I, I know I'm going to make a lot of enemies here, <laughs> so I'm going to say it anyway. Here we go. Um, if, if somebody is allowed to speak on the subject, chances are that either the information is no longer relevant or wrong or superseded or made up, right? Could be a lie. So, or they want you to know. Or they want you but to it's know. It's being released, right. yes. Correct. So that, that these are the, the actual, let's call it the controversial truth, the truth that the unwashed masses, i.e. us, is not ready for. Um, th that is being discouraged. And this is what we're seeing here as well. We've seen it with others. It's being discouraged from dissemination. It's being discouraged from further publications. There are people that will appear, men in black, whoever, and will tell you in no uncertain terms that at least our research has shown to stop talking. Now, I can only imagine two things at this point. One, Dave and I are completely off course in everything <laughs> we're saying because no one has warned us at this point. Yeah. Or... Or, and this is uh, going especially for our hypothesis, it no longer matters. Mm. We've progressed way too far down the rabbit hole to even come out of Sorry. Put it this way. It, 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 it appears that it no longer matters because those that are in charge of this whole uh, uh, Mary, uh, you know, uh, puppet theater think that it has progressed so far down the track that no one can change it any longer. Right? These are just a couple of thoughts for you guys here, okay? Um, Bender might very well have known what flying sources were, at least a portion of them, right? Because we know there are different sources for this uh, phenomenon. But he later revealed in a local newspaper in a visit by three men who apparently confirmed he was right about his UFO theory, but put him in sufficient fear to immediately close down his organization and cease publication of the journal. Dave. Just let me just let me pause you there because I lost your audio for the first sentence. It said, oh, um, "Sorry, that's no, okay." Bender might very well have known what flying saucers were, uh, at least a portion of them, but he later revealed in a local newspaper interview that he was keeping um, his knowledge a secret following a visit by three men who apparently confirmed he was right about his identified flying object theory but put him in sufficient fear to immediately close down his organization and cease publication of the journal. Mickey, it, it, got, a bit, it got a bit choppy. That, it got a bit choppy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that I should uh, lose my audio at this point, I think. <laughs> yeah, right? we always consider that a, an issue. Um, yes. It has been argued that the story of being visited by three strangers and being warned off was a front to close a publication that was losing money. However, the fact that Bender had been scared to death and actually couldn't eat for a couple of days was verified by his friends and associates. It is also widely known that such stories, and in inverted commas stories, are often spread by the United States and other governments to discredit those who might just have the truth, or at least a portion of it. In Go ahead, Mickey. No, no, go in 1963, a full decade after his visit from the Three Strangers, Bender was seemingly prepared to reveal more of his story in a largely unreadable book entitled Flying Sources and the Three Men in Black. The book was scant on facts, however, it described extraterrestrial spacecraft that had bases in Antarctica. This was apparently the truth Bender was terrorized into not revealing, Mekki. Bender also provided images of the sources he was aware of. He produced drawings of unidentified flying objects that he was aware of, not saucers, um, as, as were the common depictions of the time, but rather flying wings, <clears throat> you know, that, um, like a B-52 design, like the, mm. the, 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 not B-52, uh, the, the stealth bomber. Yes. Um, the which B2. showed three bubble-like protrusions on the underside, reminiscent of the German-designed Hanebu 
Zwei or two, which was allegedly only in the design stage at the end of World uh, War II, alongside a cylindrical cigar-shaped object, which is in fact this is the, the most common sighting in the 19th century was the, the cylindrical cigar-shaped mm -hmm. object, and certainly the the wing. I mean, look at it today. We've we've got the stealth bombers. There they are, right? That's exactly what they look like, like a flying wing. And Ernst Zundel, a German scientist turned author and known for his internet zigrams, who had entered the U.S. under Operation. Paperclip. Paperclip. Hello. <laughs> a United States Army CIA program to bring German scientific talent into the United States in spite of any so-called war crimes, which they were alleged to have committed at the end of the war and who worked at Wright Airfield, later Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where the Roswell debris was eventually housed, also claims about, made claims about the nature of the activity in Antarctica. Okay, so there was, a, there was a mouthful. So Operation Paperclip, everybody knows Operation Paperclip. You know what's going on there, right? This is, this is clear. But this, this Zundel, who, was, who came across the States under that operation and then worked at uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where the Roswell debris was shipped, made claims about activity in Antarctica. That's a lot to take in. In the 1970s, um, Zundel published a book called UFOs, oh, sorry, in 1970 rather, uh, Nazi secret weapons question mark UFOs Nazi secret weapons question mark and it made the claim that at least some UFOs were German secret weapons which were developed during the Second World War and that some of them had been shipped out towards the end of the war and been hidden at the poles poles not pole poles publication of the book coincided with a tidal wave of renewed interest in all things paranormal coming on the heel of what was to be the last major UFO wave of the 20th century, and Zundel was a guest on, uh, on countless talk shows where he shared his views on spaceships, free energy, electromagnetism, emergent technologies, and some of the positive contributions made by the Germans in these fields. Absolutely true. Mickey, we don't have very much longer. We've only got about two you minutes. Not. Yes, let's... Look, I'd, I'd just like to... Like, let's pause it there. Okay. Yes. Because yes, yes. what what I'd like to say is we're we're presenting and have presented so far uh, a lot of information, and we want you to take it in. So just to sum it up, there there is proof and uh, missing vessels, missing U-boats, uh, lots of troops that have weren't accounted for. Um, there have been uh, at, after the end of the war. We know there's there's missing equipment. Um, all seems to have been shipped to Antarctica. The US went after it and then set up bases and no-go and no go zones. It's, it's limited area. You can't just go down there. You can't get in a boat and go down there yourself. It's all organized. You've got to be uh, signed in, approved, and, and go on your, um, you know, your targeted mission, whatever it is, so usually scientific. I... I would, wouldn't hesitate to suggest that this uh, is, is entirely plausible and that it's, it's more than likely true. I don't know, where they, you know whether they had a base, whether the base already existed, whether it was already an underground one, whether it was uh, run by extraterrestrials or terrestrials. I think we'd have to have a new term, Mickey, for the, yes, some creatures yes. that live here along with us that maybe just live underground or something. Yeah, what, what I completely we... agree. Now, this this goes, of course, in line with uh, the sightings of USOs, the the un un unidentified submerged um, objects, which you you um, also have a lot of, um, and 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 which move at rapid speeds rather than flying. These are submerged uh, submerged underwater, mm. uh, and uh, you have you have a lot of those in the Atlantic, in the South Atlantic. You know, you have, you have them off the be of the Bimini Coast, off the coast of Florida. You have them in the Pacific as well. So you you have you have um, <laughs> a lot of things going on, and and yet we choose to watch the reality TV shows. You know, we, we choose to uh, have near food experiences, and and to dull our senses with sugar and 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 and, and protein and fat that we don't really need. Um, and and these mysteries go completely uninvestigated, completely. These days, very few people truly go out there and investigate. Very, 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 very few compared to to the billions that live on the planet. Yeah, think about it. Think about it. We're, we're, there's there's a seven billion of us, and 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 we 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 don't know the bottom of the ocean as well as we know the uh, the um, the moon. Um, and and Antarctica, forget it. 
when was the last real Antarctic dis- uh, expedition? I mean, there are very few. There are very few people that, that go to the Antarctic. It's, it's a skeleton crew, right, of, 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 uh, of staff in these bases. And that's a continent. It's the size of Australia. The Antarctic is the size of Australia. Okay, it's huge. It's massive. Mm-hmm. And, and the population is, you know, maybe a couple dozen, maybe a few hundred, you know, during the summer months. That's it. That's it. And they're, they're, they're confined to the, to the base camps that exist. That's it. That nobody goes for expeditions looking for stuff. Clearly, they are. They must be. The military for sure is. You know, um, but, but we don't know about it. It's, it's just nuts. It's crazy. It's, uh, I don't have a word for it, Dave. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, even, I'll shed some light even further on this. If you were to go to Google Earth and spin it round to have a look at Antarctica, most of it is cut and paste. Mm-hmm. You don't actually see the real snow for the majority of the continent. It's just right. white and painted over white. Yeah. Only the edges, and, and, and some may argue, oh, that's because you, know, you can't take a great photograph of something that's only white. Not true. Mm-mm. Not true. It's uh, you know, even though it's two miles high, two miles of ice, you're going to see something there, and maybe there's something to hide. That's right. Um, we know that this is the end of our show tonight, so we'll see you next week for show 193, and um, have a great week. Let's hope we make it. Take care, everyone. Oh, and don't forget to donate. This is Listener Funded Radio. Oh, and comments below, by the way. I want to get some comments. See you later.